this is the second Global Learning at Evidence Exchange. The first one was in Thailand, and I was able to attend that one as well. So I'm really excited to hear and see the comparisons between the two, but I think that um, it looks to be an exciting event. Uh, before we go on, I wanted to just sort of take us back to where we are writ large with global food security and the US government. Uh, as you all know, I am sure, on July 20th, 2016, President Obama signed into law the Global Food Security Act. Um, this is hugely important for a lot of reasons. First of all, it codifies into law what we've been doing under Feed the Future. It transitions Feed the Future from a presidential initiative to a congressional initiative. Also, we saw huge bipartisan and bicameral support for the Global Food Security Act. Uh, the act passed the Senate with unanimous consent and passed the House with 369 votes in favor. So in an era where we're not seeing a lot of sort of bipartisan friendship and collaboration, there is broad support on both sides of the aisle in both, how, in both the House and the Senate for what we do on global food security. And the reason is that it's very important in this world and people recognize it. I think the other reason we have such strong support is that as an initiative, we have spent a lot of uh, time, money, effort, and thought into really making sure that we're measuring our progress. So we can go tell appropriators, when you put money into global food security, here's what you're going to get. You all have delivered impact at scale, and we're able to measure it, and we're able to communicate that to our um, constituencies on the Hill. So I just want to thank you all for all you've done on that front, doing amazing work, being able to monitor it, being able to evaluate it, and being able to tell people about it. So that's why we're at, we are where we are with the support that we have. Um, so I think everyone thought that this bill would pass much longer uh, before, and that we'd have maybe a year to get together an interagency strategy that would cover you know, all of the globe that we're working on with 11 US government agencies. Um, and those of you who know Washington bureaucracy know that that is an enormous feat, an enormous feat. I'm just going to leave it at that. So, but because it took so long to get the bill passed, we had 11 weeks. In order to um, pull together the strategy, strategy so quickly, we really built upon a lot of work we'd done in what we call the looking back, looking forward exercise, looking at data that we had across the initiative, doing a lot of interviews with people, with you, you folks in the field, partners, learning sort of what went really well in Feed the Future 1.0 and what we needed to improve on. We also had um, a series of workshops where we brought in experts to look at emerging issues that maybe we hadn't so fundamentally considered in Feed the Future 1.0, such as youth, such as um, urbanization, such as fragility. And so all of that work we'd done in the year preceding the signing of the act, we were able to really put that into practice and put the global food security strategy together in record time. And um, I think, you know, we, we think it's a good strategy that really reflects a broader and more complex understanding of global food security and what we need to do to affect change. And I think that there's a copy of this, of the results framework in your books. Is that right? Okay. And so if you haven't already sort of dug deep into this results framework, I hope that you will, because that's what we're looking at going forward. And if you look at the results framework, uh, you'll recognize a lot of things, and then there are some new things. So you'll recognize inclusive ag-led growth, and I think that's something that we had in Feed the Future 1.0. But if you look sort of in the IRs and down below, you'll see there's a more, much more complex understanding of what it means to have inclusive ag-led growth. Production is important, but it's really important to go beyond. Um, and I think that that is a lot of what we're talking about here, recognizing the importance of systems change and of market systems in what we do. And I'm really excited to hear all you've done to really innovate and go beyond well into the new strategy. Um, and we've learned a lot from you to actually develop this. Um, you'll also see that resilience has been elevated as, um, as an objective, and I think that really reflects our understanding and our need, to, um, our need to elevate resilience in areas where we have recurrent humanitarian crises, areas where people are living very close to the poverty level, and very small shocks can send them back in. I was just in Uganda last week where every, uh, for every three people who come out of poverty, two people fall back in. And so I think that that really shows why we need to focus on resilience throughout our portfolio. And I think that you all have led the way in helping us understand 
um, what that means. And we look forward to, to actually working with you on pushing that forward. The third objective is nutrition, which again, you'll also recognize from Feed the Future 1.0. But if you look down in the IRs, you'll see a much more uh, complex understanding of what it takes to really move the dial on nutrition. And again, a lot of that learning comes out of the field um, from you all and also experts elsewhere. Today, we're here to focus on market systems. Um, again, like I said, I think that's something that we've realized we need to focus a lot more on under the objective inclusive ag-led growth. Um, so to achieve our goals, we really need market systems to work so we can do more and so we can do it faster. Um, we want to make sure there's investment throughout the market system, um, through value chains and the enabling environment that's really connecting producers to market, um, better connecting rural to urban, and really generating jobs and demand for local goods and services. Um, Lisa outlined the Senegal example of how, what you've really done to, um, to really move the market system in Senegal, which has been a very, very impress impressive effort. Um, I think it's very fitting that the Markets Glee is in Senegal, so we can learn more about the example here um, and look forward to all of you being able to get out and actually seeing some of that. Um, I'm uh, mad at broader forces that are pulling me out and I can't go on the field trip. I've wanted to go see this project for a long time. But anyway, all of you get to go, so you're all very lucky. And But last week I was able to go out to the field in Senegal and see what they were doing to actually move market systems um, on a slightly different approach. But again, these types of innovations, um, your ability to really get the market system moving, we're seeing lots of different examples of it in different countries and look forward to sort of that exchange um, today. Um, next, I just wanted to emphasize that when we're working with market systems, we need to make sure and focus our efforts on being increasingly catalytic, recognizing that our development dollars are really a small portion of the pie, and that to really move this, that we need governments to have the enabling environment, to invest their own funds in agriculture in the right ways that can fuel the sector, and of course, really work to support and unlock the private sector, which is the engine of growth going forward in the ag sector. I think that this is always important in what we're doing, and we've seen in Feed the Future shifting from a sort of service provision model to one of this, to one of a more catalytic relationship building influencer model. And I think that that is where we need to go for good development. I also think that given our current budget environment, um, which has a lot of ups and downs in it, I think it's also important to really dig deep and figure out where it is we need to intervene most to be more catalytic. What are the core things we need to do to move the sector? Lastly, I just want to say I've been with Feed the Future since the very beginning. I think I see a lot of you in the room who have also been at Feed the Future since the very beginning. Um, and what we're seeing now in our country programs, in dialogue from governments, I was just at the CADAP partnership platform meeting last week in, in Uganda, um, how we're seeing the private sector engage. These are things that I think I at least never thought possible when we started this in 2010. And the kind of transformation that we're already seeing really due to all of your investment, all of your work, all of your creativity, and all of your innovation is, is um, truly amazing, inspiring, and I look forward to even more exciting news throughout these this week. So thank you for your time, and I look forward to being able to participate with you.